Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Emma Bryan, and I am the Community Engagement Specialist here at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you've joined us for tonight's presentation. Ask a curator on the digital exhibition, Paul Gunter, Studio Portraiture to Art Photography. This digital exhibit is in collaboration with the 2021 Louisville Photo Biennial. Now I will introduce tonight's speakers and the curators of the virtual exhibition. Daniel, Sp Daniel Spilenka is the Associate Curator of Digital Projects at the Filson Historical Society, where she provides vision and leadership for the Filson's digitization and digital preservation projects. Prior to joining the Filson staff in April of 2019, Ms. Spilenka held the role of Preservation Specialist at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and served as the project director for the digital POWRR project. She holds a, B, holds a BA in history from St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, and an MA LIS from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Heather Potter is the curator of photographs and prints at the Filson Historical Society. Prior, she was a project archivist at the Kentucky Historical Society. Potter received her BA in history from Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, and Master of Library Science from Indiana University, Bloomington. Her main role as curator of photos is to catalog and provide access to the Filson's visual materials collection. In addition, she is an advocate for the preservation of family photograph collections. Abby Briney, Abigail Briney, is a graduate student at the University of Louisville in the Critical and Curatorial Studies program. Abby received her BA in Art History from the University of Louisville last spring, so congratulations to Abby for recently graduating. In her last semester of undergrad, she served as the Commonwealth Center for the Humanities Exhibits intern at the Filson. Her main role here was to curate the art photography section of this exhibit through extensive research, photograph selection, and label writing. In the future, Abby is hoping to work as a curator for art from the 19th century to the contemporary. Now, I'm finished with my introduction, but I will return after we hear a little bit more from our curators about their work on the exhibition. So please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Hello everyone. I have the pleasure to speak first. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for just, hang on for just one moment. All right, thank you. Hello everyone, virtually out there. We are so pleased to be here this evening to provide a guided glimpse into our photo biennial uh, submission, which is Paul Gunter Studio Portraiture to Art Photography. This exhibit is based on the Ball Gunter photograph collection here at the Filson Historical Society. We had hoped it was going to be a physical exhibit where you can come in person, but due to the ongoing COVID pandemic, we made the difficult choice to make it a virtual only. Uh, we hope that it's actually a little bit more accessible this way, and we're really excited to give you a tour and some background information this evening. Uh, Gunter's work documents three aspects of his career and his life. Uh, studio photography, works he created to make a living, family photography, snapshots of intimate views of his family and friends, and art photography, where he focused on capturing the natural world, architecture, and people, including several unique views of the African-American community here in Louisville. Like other prominent Louisville photographers of the time, Paul Gunter's work undoubtedly is represented in the personal collections of countless uh, Louisville families and in photographic collections at historical institutions. But what makes the collection here at the Filson so significant is that it's Gunter's personal collection and it more completely and documents and preserves the legacy of his work. We really get to see what was important to him. The photographs reveal more than Gunter's skill as a commercial photographer. In them, we see his favorite subject material as well as his as his interest in the experimentation with evolving photographic techniques, which there were many at that time period when he was an avid photographer. 
um, such as lighting and focus and many other techniques. So this exhibit provides an insight into his life and the legacy of the photographs he left behind. So there's, a, there's very little uh, biographical information available on Gunter, but we do know some vital information that has been passed through the family or has actually been discovered through research and documentation for this exhibit. He was born in Hanover, Germany in 1857, the son of Hermann and Caroline Gunter. Uh, he married Johanna Struck here in rural Kentucky on July 31st, 1888. Johanna, sometimes lovingly referred to as Hannah in his photos, is featured heavily throughout his personal collection. Their children are also featured throughout the family photo albums. The couple had seven children together and it appears they had two sets of twins. Um, so we have, you can see on the slide here, just some of the basic um, vital information from the family. But sadly, if you look very closely, three of the children passed away in childhood um, and their firstborn, Herman Gunter, passed away as a young adult. Um, vital records don't provide the most accurate information, but based on the records available, we can provide a fairly accurate account for their children. Uh, so even though there were some tragedies that happened in the family, losing so many children, um, Gunter's, we see actually a different side of Gunter and his photography. And that's a charming personality and his love for his family that shine through the photos uh, that are over a century old. Speaking of Gunter's family, they feature very prominently in his personal photo collection through um, here at the Felsen Historical Society. And Abby, Heather, and I had such a joy uh, picking and choosing some of the really fun family photographs. And when you view his family photos, one can really imagine the patience that his children or his wife, Johanna, um, as he played around with the camera and the light settings. You can often kind of see a sigh lie a little smile like, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Is it done? <laughs> um, we can also see his you know, experimentation with light and his passion for nature. Um, one of the photographs here on the left, on the, excuse me, on the right-hand side is um, the Gunter and Struck families. Um, many of the photographs you see in his uh, personal family collection, the photos that he takes of his family are outside, they're outdoors, they're at Cherokee Park, they're at these wonderful iconic locations. You can see his love for nature that um, we'll, Abby, Abby will get to in just a moment when she talks about some of how that creeps into his later styles. And when compared to his later artistic work, these earlier family photographs show some of that those characteristics that he embraces um, of the naturalism style. Paul Gunter came from a family line of photographers and artisans back in Germany. His father, Hermann Gunter, was a builder and a professional, art, um, professional photographer. His father actually served as the official court photographer to the last king of Hanover. Gunter's older brother, Hermann Jr., was also a photographer who had a very successful studio in Hanover. So it's perhaps because of limited opportunity in the family business in Germany, Paul Gunter immigrated to the United States. Now there's probably a great reason he picked Louisville's because Louisville's German community at the time would have been flourishing when he arrived here in 1886. And seeing the numerous thriving trades uh, that were among the Louisville's German community, it's no wonder Gunter chose Louisville to establish his life and career. Germans were involved in a number of different trades, including manufacturing, finance, running department stores, breweries, and photography studios, just to name a few. There were also a number of Catholic and Protestant churches that were established for the German speaking community. And I believe that German was the prominent language that was spoken in Germ in Louisville and in Kentucky at the time, um, eating even English. 
And in the 1880s, when he arrived here in Louisville, um, Gunter was one of the more than 1.5 million Germans who emigrated to the United States in that decade. And Louisville plays prominently in Gunter's photography as well. Um, here we have a photo on the left of one of the, his homes that he had. Um, this one is on Melwood Avenue. Sadly, this building no longer is there. It's close to where the Melwood Arts and Antique Mall is today. Um, but you'll often, if you look through his photograph and when I show you um, the virtual exhibit a little bit later, you'll see that he moved around Louisville, but really loved to take photos of his family sitting on the porch to document all the places that they called home. And once again, you can see how much he loved his family and loved being outdoors in the photo um, on the right. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Heather, who's going to talk a little bit more about his uh, professional life and his professional career. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you'll just give me a moment, I'm gonna bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, so as Danielle mentioned, Gunter um, took a lot of wonderful photos of his family. Um, my section of the exhibit, I actually focused on um, the portrait studio and the media that he, the medium that he used, the cabinet card. So I just want to go over a little bit about the history um, of photography during this time period to kind of help set the stage of um, where Paul's work fits into this. So by the late 1860s, studio portraiture was on the rise and as advancements in photographic technologies made it possible to produce more affo affordable uh, photographs. So the expensive and time consuming processes of the daguerreotype of the 1840s and the amber types of the 1850s were superseded by cheaper and more widely available uh, photos, specifically mounted photographs, which include the format, the carte de visite and the cabinet card. So what really brought about this is the invention of a multi-lens camera with a repeating back um, using what is called a four tube camera, which has four lenses. The photographer could produce four separate exposures on one half of the glass plate negative, and then push the negative through uh, to expose the other half of the photograph uh, glass plate negative. So this multi-lens camera gave the photographer the ability to uncap all four lenses at once, creating the exact same image or uncapping each lens separately, ultimately creating eight separate images. So this um, ultimately allowed the photographer to sell multiple copies of an image for the first time, whereas the daguerreotype and the ambrotypes uh, were kind of one of a kind standalone images. Once the negative was done, it would be printed onto photo sensitive paper, and cut out into eight individual images and then mounted to standard cardstock. Um, this example I'm showing you here is of the carte de visite, which is the um, precursor to the cabinet card. However, um, the cabinet card actually used the same technology as uh, the CDV. So as you can see here, here's an example of what the carte de visite would look like in comparison to the cabinet card. Um, so by the 1870s, the carte de visite was waning in popularity and photographers were really looking for something bigger and better. So they drew on the same technology as the carte de visite and the cabinet card was invented. Um, so the, it was almost double the size of the CDV and the cabinet card measured in at four and a quarter by six and a half inches. And it utilized a two lens camera instead of the four lens camera prior. Um, so this created two larger photographs, um, ultimately allowing the photographer to be more creative 
uh, with their portraits um, throughout the medium, which lasted over the next three decades. So it's the cabinet card era that Gunter is when Gunter enters into the photographic scene here in Louisville. Gunter first appears in the Louisville City Directory in 1887 and is listed as an artist working for Daniel Stuber, who is another prominent German photographer here in the city of Louisville at the time. So more than likely, we are guessing that Gunter was a photograph retoucher or a photograph editor, if you're thinking of contemporary terms. Um, retouching was a very important part of the pre-processing of a photograph prior to printing and mounting the image. So due to the size, um, these larger format negatives could easily be doctored by photo artists to eliminate everything from the subject's blemishes to wrinkles to even a stray hair. So here's an example of what a retouching desk would look like. And then I found this great example of um, kind of a chart showing the removal of somebody's freckles via the negative. So here are some examples of Gunter's um, studio work. About four years after he started apprenticing or working for Daniel Stuber in 1891, Gunter appears in Louisville Six City Directory as the successor to Stuber, relocating to 434 East Market Street, where we, he would stay for nearly the next decade. It's very common during this time period for when one photographer went out of business for another photographer to kind of step in and take over the student, um, the studio, the equipment, and sometimes even the clientele. So we believe that's what happened here. You can even see on some of Gunter's um, cards, it says successor to Daniel Stuber. So he's using Stuber's um, kind of built up clientele and everybody knew who he was to help kind of launch his own studio here in Louisville. This is also really interesting um, from him going from a retoucher to a studio photographer and an owner. This would have been a pretty big transition for any photographer. Um, you have to keep in mind that photographers would have been multitaskers. They would have been receptionists. He could have been retouching printing, mounting, purchasing supplies, in addition to marketing his work in his studio. So not only did Gunter have to have an artistic eye of setting up and posing sitters, picking out backgrounds, um, and making sure all the props were in the right position, but he also was an entrepreneur. Here he is a businessman, um, kind of having to sell himself in his studio over dozens of other studios that are soliciting to people here in Louisville. So in addition to his work, he also worked with a lot of wholesalers um, for print supplies. And then, as I said, he would have had to also market and brand himself during this time. And I really think that in addition to being just a straight portrait photographer, you can really see as Danielle mentioned through his work, um, he also was keeping track of photographic trends of the time. And really, as Abby's about to speak on, um, he really realized that photography was more than just a profession, that it actually was an art form. And this was kind of the era where this um, idea of photography being an art form came to fruition. So in about 1901, uh, Gunter relocated to 309 um, 4th Street, where he remained through the duration of um, until he closed down his studio. So I'm going to turn it over to Abby, and she's going to go over um, some information and show you some images of uh, his art photography. So just bear with me for one moment while we switch screens. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so yes, uh, in just a moment, I'll share my screen. I'll be going over the art photography section of this exhibit.
All right, so my section was a look at art photography. Um, so I kind of started this section um, by looking at the overall 20th century photographic styles. Um, the two main ones were called pictorialism and naturalism. So both of these were similar uh, in that they had a soft focus and very careful tonality. Um, careful tonality, they, they valued um, this over sharp lines or excessive details, um, but each was distinguished from the other through their intention. Uh, so for pictorialism, the intent was to convey emotion through traditionally picturesque subjects, um, which thus conveyed a philosophical musing or some form of emotion. So my example that I took from Gunter's work um, is the top image to the left. So you can see that it's a very grandiose image of nature that's supposed to evoke in the viewer some form of awe. The other form um, is naturalism. So the goal of nat naturalism is to show nature as the eye would normally see it. So this means that the artist, the photographer, wants you to look at this picture and feel like you're within nature. So my example also from Gunter's work is this bottom image here. Um, probably one of the best descriptions of naturalism comes from Peter H. Emerson, who really wrote the rules on naturalism. And it says, in this mingled decision and indecision, this lost and found lies the charm and mystery of nature. So the second, the second section that I worked on was the unique style of Paul Gunter. So his style is mostly naturalism. Um, he employs an expert soft focus that mimics the eye. So it's sharp at one point, but also um, fades around the outside. Um, in addition, his perspectives make viewers feel like they can walk right into the picture. He's often placed where you can look out at the horizon at eye level. However, his work is so unique in that it refuses this strict categorization. Um, so he experiments with different things like movement, which you can see in this image that I've included. Um, he has multiple images where he shows the trees swaying in the wind. He has others where he shows water rushing through a stream. And to me, this really shows his artistic eye and his innovation. That wasn't something that a lot of people were doing at the time. Um, in addition, with his art photography, he also used subjects outside of nature. I know Danielle mentioned earlier a little bit about his family and about his images of the African American community, but he also photographed architecture a lot. So here's some examples of that. Um, you can see here his wife, uh, Johanna, um, also known as Hannah, and then um, actually the Hogan's Fountains from Cherokee Park. Uh, finally, this section, I wasn't when I started, I wasn't sure that I was going to include this, but then it became clear just how important it was to this history and to Gunter's history. Um, so the camera club consisted of a group of amateur photographers who gathered to create, discuss, and display their photos in their own leisure time as a hobby, but a very important hobby to them. Um, the camera club was really essential to the spread of photography, both as an art and as hobbies. And it made photography accessible. This was in the time before Kodak, but really this is what led up to it. Um, however, the artists who worked in photography, um, they really rejected the work of camera clubs as you know, amateur or almost inferior in some way, because it seemed to be beneath the quote unquote fine art, the fine arts being uh, painting, sculpture, et cetera. But, these professional artists who worked in the medium of photography, they couldn't ever sever themselves totally from the camera club. Um, their stylistic development really followed along with where camera clubs were going. Um, so the earliest style being this early snapshot style uh, by camera clubs led these professional artists, quote unquote professional artists, um, to develop pictorialism, which is a lot more stylized and based on a lot of different art history references. When camera clubs then adopted this pictorialism, that's when professional artists, real artists, developed straight photography, which came to be um, more popular in about the 1930s. Uh, but the camera club really was important. And when you look at their photography, it's very good photography. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Danielle to walk us through, to walk us through the digital exhibit. 
All right, so because we can't have you in person, unfortunately, we are able to provide a virtual exhibit. And the easiest way to visit the virtual exhibit is by starting at our website, philsonhistorical.org. You can see on the top here, you go to the visit us section uh, right here on the bottom and go to exhibits. You'll see our upcoming and current exhibits that we have on display. And right here on the top, you see current exhibit of, um, for a photo biennial. So you just click on this first part right here. It takes you to our virtual exhibit. So we have a nice landing page and this wonderful, um, playful fo uh, photograph, this postcard that he sent out for a New Year's photo one year um, that gives you all the background information about uh, some of the biographical information, some of the basic information about Funcher and his work. And as you can imagine and see that we divided this exhibit into three sections, his life, his portrait studio and professional life, and then his art photography. So if you look here on the right, you see those three main sections of the exhibit. And I'll go ahead and uh, focus on the art photography since Abby just gave us a wonderful overview about his style and how he incorporated that into his work. You click on that part, you get a main landing page that gives some information and some wonderful um, research that Abby has gone into. And from there, she's even broken it down into different, uh, into different sections that give you more information about the art photography, naturalism, uh, and then the camera club as well. So if we click on Venture Style of Naturalism, we get some of the images, you know, some of the information that she just explained, and then more, um, more uh, examples of his work. So we, we weren't able to show everything in this uh, presentation. We wouldn't want to. We want you to take a look around for yourself. But say, you know, this image of Hogan's Fountain catches your eye and you want to look at it a little bit more. Simply click on the photograph. And it gives you a little bit more information about the actual photograph um, here at the Filson Historical Society. And you can see a much larger image. And if that isn't the wanting more and want to see an even larger version of it, just click on it once more. And it gives you some really wonderful detail. You can really now see some of that amazing, the soft focus, the the eye level, everything that Abby talked about in his artwork, um, hearing Abby talk again just gives me a more another appreciation for his style photography. And really, you can scroll in, zoom in and out. That's a little bit too much, but you can really play around and see some of that um, in his work. Uh, now, you can always use the back button, as I have just done. Uh, but you can also continue to navigate using the side panel from the different sections of his photography. Um, I'll go ahead and click on this other image right here. This is the one that Abby had highlighted in her talk about some of that soft focus that mimics the natural, how the, how the eye would naturally view something. Um, so we get the description of the photograph, how we are able as curators to pull the image, but then you get to see in greater detail. And if I click on it just once more, we get to really now see some of the, um, you know, the balance between the soft focus, things that are slightly out of focus versus some sharper images. Um, we were a little concerned when put it when we decided to make this a virtual only exhibit. We really wanted to make this an in-person exhibit because the photographs themselves are when you look at them in person are really breathtaking. They're truly stunning and breathtaking. We were a little worried that some of those, that finer detail that really makes it stand out uh, would get lost when you digitize the originals and put it online. But I think we were able to capture some of that. And I think this particular photo really captures that as well. Let's see, what else? So yeah, if you, um, Basically navigating, but your way around this site, if you get a little bit lost, 
feel free to use always go back to the back button. But if you're lost in this exhibit, because we do have other virtual exhibits and other collections on this uh, on our digital collections page, always come back to the browse exhibits page on this tab up here. And uh, these you can navigate to, they're all done uh, alphabetically. So in this case, we have Paul Gunter. So it starts with P for Paul. You can always make your way back if you get lost while you are clicking through things. And I'm just scrolling up and down. Um, so if you go to the browse exhibits, um, everything uh, is done alphabetically. So you can just simply uh, navigate your way back to the Paul Gunter exhibit. And so you can see once again, that we are back to the main landing page. I don't wanna show everything because I wanna encourage everyone to really take some time and look around. Um, but part of this isn't just us talking, this is called Ask a Curator. So um, we are going to open up our, open things up for questions. And Emma is, has graciously said that she would moderate. Yes, thank you all so much that what you were saying, Danielle, that the more that you all talk about it, the more I appreciate his photography. It really is incredible. And the overview that Danielle gave of our Omeka page, it's a really excellent resource. So you should go on there and explore definitely the Paul Gunter exhibit, but all of the exhibit and digital collections that we have there. We also have um, digitized a bunch of our photographs in our Past Perfect online that's accessible through our website as well. There are tons of digital resources available to you on your website, so maybe after you get off the call tonight, you can do some exploring and browsing. But with that, we'll get into the Q&A portion. We already have some great questions coming in through the chat. So if you have a burning question for these curators here, this is your chance to ask. Sometimes curation and archival work can be a little mysterious. So this is a, a time for us to be candid and answer those questions that you've always had. So we'll start with our first question that came in through the chat. And this is going to be for Heather, as she is our curator of photographs and prints. Heather, do you know approximately how many photographs we have in our collection? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't have an exact number. Back in the 90s, they said over 100,000. I think we're well past that. So I'd say at least, you know, closer to like two, 300,000, if not higher than that in the, in the collection. A lot. <laughs> that's a lot of photographs. It is. <laughs> and that's probably a low count. <laughs> There's a lot of different types of photographs which all have different preservation needs too. I just want to throw that in there. Yes, exactly. The next question we had come through the chat is, do you know, this is for Abby, do you know what year the photograph of the wind in the trees was made? And they comment, all that you have shown us is beautiful. Well, thank you. I think most of his collection is absolutely gorgeous. Um, so we're not sure exactly what time, because most of these are in his personal collection, we don't have a lot of record of them unless he wrote down the date, which for most of his art photography, unfortunately, he didn't. Um, for some of his family photos, he did. I think we can guess most of them are in the early 1800s, maybe somewhere around 1810 to 1820, 25. Um, I'm not entirely sure where that is either. That may be not in Kentucky. I don't remember if we had, Heather, do you remember if we had looked at that? Yeah, so just to clarify, I think Abby meant 1910s. Yes, thank um, you. That's okay. I just don't want people to think that <laughs> we have like one of the first photos. Um, no, as Abby said, these were really hard to date. The uh, photographs with individuals, we could look at styles, clothing. We did, she did a lot of research in census records because some of the people were named. So we could kind of get a date range, but for the natural photography, it was extremely hard because there, he didn't label things. Um, so we really don't know locations of the trees. There are several different views of trees, several waterfalls. Um, we do think a lot of them are probably Southern Indiana. 
However, we did find at least one or two images um, that he labels as Texas. So right now we consider these unidentified and undated because we don't have uh, enough concrete information to kind of whittle that down. And just to jump in, sorry, um, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly again. Um, because if you actually click on the image itself, um, you can get more information about it. Um, so it, if we know the information, like if it, the location, the creator, um, and the date, in this case, it's just undated, but clicking on the actual image will give you a little bit more of that information about location, date, um, approximate that we know of. So just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, and if you have any guesses for our photographers in the audience, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to know. Yeah, that's a great point, Heather. I think a lot of times we can be, a lot of curators and archivists can be seen as experts, and they are in a lot of ways, but it really does take a community to help us learn about the photography or artifacts or portraits that we have in our collection. So if you have information about this, We'd really like to hear from you. Another question that came through in the chat, and Danielle, I'll, I'll hand it to you first. Can you talk more about the process of digitizing old photography? And they comment, it's interesting thinking about how early photography is transformed into dig digital formats. Sure, absolutely. This is a passion project of mine, um, obviously, since that's my job here at the Filson. So, Many people, when I describe my job, think that most of the time I'm sitting there and literally pressing the button on the scanner and putting it online. And actually that's just a tiny little fraction of what happens. Most of the work when it comes to digitizing photography, especially is thinking ahead and outlining. It's a large part of it is the selection process. And there's a lot of work that goes into putting this online. Um, digitizing is more than just pushing the button on the scan, the scanner and being done with it. Um, that is a part of it, but you also need to think of how people are going to find and use the, the photographs. Um, so keeping the context together, how are you gonna do that? How are people going to, how are you gonna describe the photograph? Uh, it's a little bit different than just putting a label on a folder, you have to, put it in a digital format, like our Omeka digital exhibits platform and transform it in a way that's usable. Um, and these photographs, especially for more technical information, you really need to think about the, specification, the specifications of how you're digitizing it and what equipment you need. Most of the time you can put things on a flatbed scanner, um, Many of you might even have them at your house, but having it in a high enough resolution so that it can be seen and it's not too pixelated, you wanna find that balance of, you know, representing the photograph in a way um, online. For certain photographs, they might not be in a condition where you can scan them. Maybe they're oversized, they're in bound uh, albums, which actually did happen in many cases. So you might need specialized equipment with some of his bound photograph uh, family collections. And I believe even some of his natural uh, ones, Abby nodding, yes. Um, we had to use our overhead scanner and digital equipment. And that involves a lot more that mimics the photography process. It's a lot of setup of lighting and shadows and really it's, there's a lot more calibration that goes into um, into actually thinking about how it's going to look um, in a digital format, which is, I think, a little bit more um, in line with actually taking photographs, thinking about the lighting, the specifications, and all that such. Thank you, Danielle. We just had another question come in through the chat, and I'll, I'll pose it to, to all of you. Maybe um, one of you can chime in. Do you know if he or any Louisville photographers had any connection with the photo secession? This was a group of Americans devoted to pictorial photography, their endeavor to compel its recognition, 
not as a handmaiden of art, but as a distinctive medium of individual expression. It was mostly Northern, a Northern group founded by Alfred Steiglitz and others in 1902. Uh, if you are okay, I can kind of jump in here. Um, so we are not totally sure. It's possible um, if I was to make a uh, I guess as someone who's looked at his photography, I would say no. Um, in general, I think that the photo sessionists would have seen him more as a hobby photographer, um, despite you know the status of his work and the quality of his work. Um, and I'm not sure that they would have been involved with him. Um, other Louisville photographers, it's possible, um, but it, we may be a little south for involvement in that. Yeah, I would agree with that, Abby. Um, I'm also trying to see if he had any connection to, the, I believe it's called the Wonderland Way, which is also another local artist group here in town, um, because he was, you know, we have, we know of another photographer, Joseph Cremens, and we just got some of his materials. And when we look at his materials and Gunter's materials um, in the natural setting, they often um, are very similar. But these are little things that we, you know, there isn't a biography written on him outside of the information we got from the family and then digging deeper into records that are now available online. Um, so some of these things may be, a, as I call a history mystery, where, you know, we'll continue piecing together and finding more information as more um, resources are available online. I do find it likely, though, um, you know, somebody who you can see in his in his art photography that he kept up with these styles that he would have known about them and known about their goals. Um, and it could even be how he learned more about pictorial styles, but it may be something that we just, just won't know. Thank you all. So we would still love questions from the chat. We also have some questions prepared to ask as well. So I'll jump into those so we can talk more about this specific exhibit and more about curation in general. So my first question is for Danielle. And the question is, did you learn anything unexpected about Paul Gunter as you researched his personal and family life? Yes. <laughs> um, so I focused, the section I focused on was his personal life. And the information that we were given was pretty, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, very limited. Uh, but thanks to more vital records that are available online, including baptismal records that Heather found in from Germany, and we had to kind of guess that it was a baptismal record thanks to Google Translate and other things, uh, we were able to piece together some things. Um, one of the biggest mysteries for me was, you know, his family was such a huge part of his photography. But then when we looked at a family tree that was provided when the collection was given to us, it listed seven children. And I was like, well, there's, there's only like three <laughs> in some of the photographs. And so at one point, Heather and I jumped in a car and drove to Cave Hill Cemetery to track down some of the burial records because we didn't know until we actually went there to see, was it this person? Are they in the same plot? Is it a different country? Because there's so many Germans in Louisville, or is it the same family? So um, we were, I think, really able to uh, identify some of his more um, personal information and some piece together more of his life story. Um, one other thing I didn't mention and I didn't forgot to showcase is that um, we have a map feature in um, Omeka. So especially he photographed many of his residences throughout Louisville. It was kind of nice to see, like he kind of lived in some of the German sections of Louisville, um, but it was really fun and surprising to find those addresses. Um, some of them are still existing today. And so if you click on some of the photos of the homes, it'll actually take you to a map of where they would have been or where they're still standing today. So, um, those were some of the surprising things from the research, but just taking a step back when Heather proposed this particular collection for the photo biannual and she showed me some examples. I mean, 
they're, they're just so stunning. They really took my breath away. And I think to me, that was the most surprising aspect of just how beautiful this photography style could be. Cause you really think from this time period for to visit some studio portraiture. So I think the surprising overall thing and every time we kept looking and choosing was just these stunning photos that we got to look at. Thank you, Danielle. We'll maybe move into a little more of the general questions that we have about curation and archival work. So this question is for Heather. How has exhibit work changed during the COVID-19 pandemic? And maybe the question should be, what has it changed? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, as we kind of alluded to in the beginning, when we brought Abby on as an exhibits intern, we were still slated to do an in-person exhibit. Um, Danielle and I had already begun the research process. We already had our exhibit select sections of where things would physically go in the gallery. These were sections, not necessarily selected items for display, um, but because of the pandemic, and the fact that we already had an exhibit that had not been seen by the public because we shut down when it was open, we made the hard choice of pivoting and putting things online. Now, this took me a little while and thanks for Danielle because she does this all the time to conceptualize. I was still set in looking at a physical room and had my walls laid out thinking, okay, this wall is gonna be this, this wall is going to be this. Um, and that's how I had done curation before. And she had to re kind of train my mind and teach me of, well, you can still have that, but now it's this landing page instead of a wall, it's a landing page. So we were able to take the core of our initial plans and still easily translate that to an online platform and then Basically, we still walked Abby through the curation process, kind of explaining to her, well, if this was in person, we would do it this way, but because it's online, we're going to do it this way. So she actually, although we were both very disappointed, like Danielle and I have having to break the news of saying, you're not going to get to work on a physical exhibit, she kind of got the best of both worlds because she did get to see the full um, curation process and work through some of the challenges we deal with with a physical exhibit. But then she also got to help with a really great online program or an online exhibit. Um, and then it's gonna be online forever. So like she can put that on her resume. So it, in the end, it worked out. Um, I would say that big pivot was um, going from, I'm a very visual person. So visualizing it in a room is very different than visualizing it on the computer. Um, but thanks to Danielle and her experience, she was able to kind of walk us through how that flow would work online. So that I would think is probably the biggest, um, was the biggest transition as everybody has had to go through of going from in-person to online. Every, you know, the entire world made this huge pivot and that was the same with the exhibit uh, process as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Heather. I think there sometimes is some confusion about physical exhibits versus virtual exhibits, and they're very two very different things. So I'm glad that you took us through that process. So we did have another question come through in the chat about Gunter's religious affiliation. Danielle, do you know whether Gunter was Protestant or Catholic, or if he involved was involved with a parish or or church community here in Louisville? All that question come in and I was trying to look through some of my um, some of my research. So here in Louisville, I was not able to track down um, if he was part of a church. We do have a lot of church records, especially um, ones that um, that are were German speaking. We have their you know baptism marriage records. The marriage record information that we have is from Jefferson County. Um, his obituary just says that his you know funeral. Uh, it wasn't at a church and then he was buried at Cave Hill Cemetery. Um, one of the pieces that Heather was able to track down from um, Ancestry.com actually that has access to some German vital records um, was his baptismal certificate. Uh, 
but it doesn't say <laughs> if it was a German, um, if it was Protestant or Lutheran or Catholic. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know. Um, I was really hoping to find if he was a part of a parish or a church community. I mean, that would have made so much sense being new to Louisville, but we just one of those information, again, we couldn't quite figure out, unfortunately. Thank you. Another question is, how do collections like this come to you, come to the Filson? What would you like to have in conjunction with such a collection of photographs? Heather, would you like to, to tackle this one? Sure. So um, in an archival setting, which we are, we can get collections in three major ways. One is through donation, through the general public like you. And that's how we received this collection. It was actually donated um, by the Gunter family here in Louisville. The other way is through acquisition and purchase, meaning um, we have an acquisitions fund. So we have a set amount of money set aside for collections as a whole. So we are allocated um, to purchase. There is a review process for that. We can't just go out and buy what we want. Um, and then what was I gonna say the third one? Well, I forget what the third one was, but those are usually the two big ones is gonna be through purchase or through donation. I guess solicitation as well, you could say, where we go out and engage in with the community um, and try to see you know, how they, one, so we can become a better part of the community, but also learn about things that we may not know about. And then as for the question of um, what would you like to have in conjunction that's a tricky one. Um, I know for our photo collection, we have a lot of 19th and early 20th century materials. Um, I'm specifically interested in better documenting different communities in Louisville. So we have a lot of old Louisville materials in certain East End neighborhoods. Um, however, we're lacking in you know, the West End of Louisville, Shively, PRP, Valley Station, um, so there are certain segments of, the, of neighborhoods that I'm always seeking family materials on. I also love to tell people you do not have to be wealthy or elite to have your materials here. Um, we have a lot of, you know, well-to-do individual collections here, and we're thankful we have those. But the Filson also is working really hard on documenting the underrepresented communities um, that are here in the city. So... I have always have to kind of people say, well, my dad was wasn't anything fancy, you know, he he worked in a lumber mill. Well, that's okay. We want that story just as much as we want the stories of senators or prominent Kentuckians. We're the we're all Kentuckians, and so we really kind of want to document everything. So I don't think that quite answers the question. Um, however, I'm always kind of trying to fill. Um, as we call collecting gaps. And so that is, I guess, you know, it all depends on what you have and if it kind of fills in one of our collecting gaps. Can I also jump in and talk a little bit about the digital aspect of it too? Um, one thing that we, that stood out for this particular collection and choosing it for an exhibit is we had, it was pretty well documented. I mean, there are a lot of gaps and a lot of unknowns, but we did get a lot of information from the family. He wrote on the photographs who people were and most of the time, especially with his family. So when right now we are still in, con in conjunction of getting, you know, historic collections, we're also seeking contemporary collections, born digital things, just because it's not in a physical medium, we can still accept it. So with current photographers, I say, give us the descriptive information, as much descriptive information as possible. So it's widely accessible and we can make it accessible. And we're not doing the guesswork. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point, Danielle. And we have actually recently accepted um, at least one or two large, almost or all digital uh, photograph collections. Um, and so, it, it we do have to we do there are still some parameters that we have to go by when accepting digital. Um, but yes, we don't just collect physical objects. We are um, now able to accept digital material as well. I did want to add, um, I think Heather and Danielle would both agree with me that if you have older photos that maybe you don't know the people in them, 
talk to the people who know and write it down because that will be so helpful if you ever donate it in the future or even just for you it's good to know those people because when it comes to us it's very hard for us to find out who those people are so if that's something you know you have photos and you don't necessarily know the people in them try and talk to the people who know and just write it at the bottom because sometimes that information you just can't get back And maybe one day those photographs will be incorporated into a digital or physical exhibition at the Filson Historical Society for future generations to learn about your family and what you do for work and your religious affiliation, that sort of thing. Great, good points, everyone. Maybe the final question here, Abby, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, you could talk specifically about this, uh, exhibition process or generally how do you choose items for an exhibit as you all have mentioned we have an expansive amount of material how do you choose what goes in and what doesn't well it's an extremely difficult process because you love everything in the collection and you really have to take it down so you don't overwhelm people and so you know you have the best of the best selections um, when I was looking at them, I wanted to look at what was his most skilled works, what were the best examples of his works that I could put out, and also which photos best demonstrated what I was talking about. So if it was pictorialism, what was his best example of that? Or naturalism, what was his best example of that? Um, and I know that we have other ones of his family, which are the best of that. Um, so if, when trying to pick them, we want the ones that are the most interesting and just the best examples to put out and show his work and his skill. Thank you. I think this will be the final question now. So if each of you would, would humor me and tell me what your favorite photo is from the exhibit, and I guess you would have to describe it to us. <laughs> But if you want to talk about your favorite photo or, yeah, that, that would be great. I, I think we would like that to wrap up. So I'll go first. And when I met with the Gunter family recently, I continued saying, oh, that's one of my favorites. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Um, because as we've all said, when you look at his collection, it's really hard to pick a favorite. You become so immersed in another family's materials. You almost become part of the family a little bit on the peripheral. Um, but I do have to say my favorite, and that's why it was selected for one of our main images for the Louisville photo biennial, was the tree swaying in the wind. Um, there's just something magical about that picture that you feel like Abby was describing that you're there, you can feel the breeze in your hair, you can smell, you know, the water in nature, but yet you're not there. And so um, I'd have to say out of all the pictures, I'm going to say it. That's my that's my favorite photo um, as of today. <laughs> oh, it's hard to pick. <laughs> um, I really fell in love with the um, y y the ones that Heather described, the natural photographs. But I think in the end, because I I focused on his life, I really love this photograph of him and Johanna. Um, sitting there having tea is an older couple and them just smiling and they're outside. I think it just encapsulates his love of uh, photography, his love of the outdoors and the love of his wife and his family um, and just probably how charming they, they both were. Um, so I think that's, um, I think that's one of my favorites. Oh, Heather, there's a question for you. That is so funny, both of you, because those are both my favorites. <laughs> I had, I was looking at the question and trying to think about it because there are so many that I love, but um, the tree swing in the wind artistically is my favorite. But the one that just made me smile is there's two pictures of Hannah and Gunter, Paul Gunter together. And the one where Paul Gunter is looking at his wife and she's like this staring at the camera is my favorite. It just makes you feel so connected to them. And you can just kind of tell how much they love each other and you know how patient she is with him. It's just my favorite. Yeah, I agree. The second, the one that Danielle was talking about is probably my all time second favorite. And then there's also a really great one. And I don't know how he did this, but it's a picture of him with a squirrel. <laughs> 
And I don't think we were able to work that into the exhibit. If we end up digitizing more of his works, we will, um, for Past Perfect Online, we will include that one. But that one was just a quirky uh, snapshot. Well, we have reached our allotted time for this evening, and that's really exciting that we have another box of materials on Paul Gunter to incorporate into our collection. Thank you so much for reaching out. And yeah, if you would like to contact us, you can find our contact information on our, our website under the About Us section that has all the staff members' emails listed there. And thank you so much again for joining us this evening. We had a really great time sharing this exhibit and we hope to see you virtually or in person soon. So take care, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.